All right, good morning, good morning. Here we are post Thanksgiving. It is now kind of the official Christmas season. <laughs> the day you get past Thanksgiving. So we are going to get fired up. I've got a, a little four part Christmas series, kind of looking towards the end of the year. Then Christmas day, we will not have Sunday school. There will be just the 1005 service. And the same thing with New Year's Day, a week later. So we will have today the 27th, the 4th, the 11th, and the 18th. Hey, Andy, welcome. You are mobile. I can just see you No, good to see you, bud. Then, like I said, the 25th and the 1st. And then when we get back on the 8th, we will get fired back up. Um, and in the latter part of January and first part of February, we'll go back to David and finish up David. And beyond that, I don't know. <laughs> but that kind of gives us kind of a long range, long range look at stuff. Then so. we should be bringing it right into Easter. And well, don't, don't even stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Don't waste our life. Stop it. I'm, I'm praying for the rapture to happen much sooner than that. <laughs> I, I'm ready to go. I am too. Mr. Eldridge, would you open us in prayer this morning, sir? Yes. Being that it is past Thanksgiving and we're into the Christmas season, it's time to get all that preparation going. Um, my house, we've started the preparation thing that started about three weeks ago. <laughs> um, and when you get into the sanctuary this morning, you'll see that that's been prepared as well. But when you start getting into these preparations for, for the Christmas season, when do you start preparing for Christmas? After Thanksgiving. After Thanksgiving. Day up. Day up. <laughs> what do you mean by preparing? Well, you know, getting, buying presents, decorating your house, uh, whatever, you know, what, what do you consider preparing for Christmas? Um, there's a lot of people that do start the day after Thanksgiving. Some don't start until December. There's somebody I know that has their Christmas cards in July. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. I like to be prepared. Yeah. <laughs> do you send them to? No, no, she doesn't send them, but she makes oh, them. Right. Because they're all these handmade, crafty things. Yeah. And so she and a girlfriend of hers, they make them, yeah. When I had little children at home and times were much tougher and money was short, I'd start preparing for Christmas as soon as things went on sale. They used to have a thing they called layaway. Yes. And I'd put stuff on layaway. Yeah, and yes. used to do that too. Yeah. yeah, we used to do that. We would start Christmas in January. And same thing. Y'all remember Kmart? Yes. Mm -hmm. And the, their great Kmart layaway that you know you could you know pay a dollar fifty a, a month on it and you know, hold it all year long and stuff. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yes. <laughs> January is the best time for my Christmas decorations. Yes. 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 Yeah. So a lot of it, everybody starts kind of preparing at different times and, and maybe different levels of it. How about this question? When is it okay? I don't want to get a fight going. <laughs> when is it okay to start listening to Christmas music? Oh, yeah. oh. Hey, I'm going to do it. Whenever you want to. When I get something to do baking, I turn the music on right there in my kitchen. It's, so it's always on for Christmas and everything. I just like the music. Yes. Andy, how about you? When do you start listening to Christmas music? Well, my daughter starts in August. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Well, and particularly if you're in, uh, if you have a, a kid in band, yeah. you know, that, that Christmas music start, and when we had kids going to uh, ALA in, in the music program, they'd be starting rehearsal and, and getting the music out for the big Christmas programs. That would start in September, so I would hear them practicing and rehearsing, you know. Yeah. Um, I, gosh, everybody, the class seems to be like whenever. I'm much more of a humbug. I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of with Scott there. I, I, I not until the day, yes. the day after Thanksgiving, I, I will acquiesce. Okay, now fine. Yes. Um, we have the Sirius radio, the, the, ex, the satellite radio in the car, and you know, the holiday tradition, which I eat Christmas music. I think it started like November 1st or something. Mm -hmm. I, I saw that on there. I said, no, no. <laughs> In Idaho, it's when the first snow falls, <laughs> then you start the Christmas music and you start thinking, oh, Christmas is coming ah. because the ground is white. Yeah. <laughs> So, and I've heard people all over the place with the Christmas music. Okay, one more, one more kind of warm-up question going this morning on this preparation idea. How early is too early for Christmas lights, and how long after Christmas is too long? Ask the HOA. <laughs> well, and I have that in my notes. According to my HOA, the 15th of January is too long. The 16th of January is too long. January 1st, New Year's Day. Yes. Yep. Is that before you take them down or just quit lighting them? Oh, you're just quit turning them on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I know in, in my neighborhood, I've got a couple of houses that are already full on. Yes. Yeah. You know, it's two days after Thanksgiving and all the inflatables are up and the lights are on. and There's only a couple, but... Yeah. yeah. Cindy and I were in, uh, we were in north of Dallas for a wedding last weekend, and um, go, our number two daughter that a lot of you follow because she has one of the more interesting lives on the planet, um, she lives in that area, so not only did we get to go to a wedding, we got to see grandkids, but as we were driving out to her place, a couple of home developments along the highway that we were driving to, there was full-on Christmas lights already. The one development said seemed like half of the. I felt like the HOA required it. Yeah, they because it. either that or all the homeowners got together and hired one of those put-on lights company, and the whole neighborhood was already lit. And that was before Thanksgiving. That was last weekend. So, yeah, all of that goes into that that preparation stuff. And and Christmas is is a time when that yeah. kind of requires. Well, it does require, but a lot of people do a lot of preparation for it. And that's what we're going to kind of look at. But sometimes if you don't prepare things, it, you can have a real disaster, can you not? Absolutely. If you just try to, you know, fly by the seat of your pants. How many of you know about the Franklin Expedition? Oh, interesting. No, that's fine. Nobody? The Franklin Expedition... Um, see, intelligent people can sometimes be unbelievably silly. This happened back in 1845. Uh, it was a British expedition sent to find the North Pole and the Northwest Passage, trying to find a sea passage around to the Orient through the North. Um, Annie Dillard, in her book, Teaching a Stone to Talk, describes the provisions that they took for that journey. Here's a quote from her book. Each sailing vessel carried an auxiliary steam engine. Well, that sounds smart. But only a 12-day supply of coal for the entire projected two- to three-year voyage. <laughs> Their idea was they would get wood and other stuff along the way to, you know, heat up the water. I mean, the Arctic has a lot of trees. Yes. <laughs> it's like they find a sail on there. Too. I, we're talking about lack of preparation here. <laughs> um, instead of additional coal, each ship of the two ships in, involved had room for a 1200 volume library, a hand organ playing 50 tunes, China place settings for the officers and the men, cut glass wine goblets, 
and sterling silver flatware. The expedition carried no special clothing for the Arctic, only the uniforms of Her Majesty's Navy. Can you imagine going into the frozen wastelands of far northern uh, Canada and Alaska and whatnot with only those kind of supplies? They did not prepare properly. They had prepared for the they had prepared the wrong things. They prepared for creature comforts, something to read, to be able to dine properly, <laughs> eat off nice flatware. Yes. Hear the music. And as a result of this lack of preparation, everybody on board those two ships died. The science now, they, they found some of their mummified, frozen mummified bodies. There's a lot of science that you can read on this. And um, they think that some of them survived upwards of a year after their ships became icebound and whatnot. Um, that had to have been a pretty brutal year. Um, some cannibalism possibly, whatnot, after their supplies ran out. A lack of preparation can really make a mess of things. Um, my kids still make fun of me, although they appreciated it when we were going. When we used to travel together as a family, I always had a folder. And in that folder was all of our reservations. Here was the hotel, the flight, the hotel, the car rental, the tickets to something. They were going, what, and everything was in that book. And I would pull that out and they would say, oh yeah, dad and his, his book. <laughs> but I, I would try to leave nothing to chance in preparation to make sure that the journey went well, that we had a good time, that everything was, was planned out. Of course, in my former life in law enforcement, preparation was key to everything. That's what kind of kept you alive at the end of the day was preparing to go into a situation um, and walk back out of it with all of the same holes in your body that you walked into. No, nothing extra. <laughs> nothing that needed to be stitched. Um, I want to kind of look at this preparation this morning a little bit because God did a lot of preparation for this Christmas season. And he started off by preparing hearts. Uh, somebody, uh, who do I have for Luke 1, 5 to 25? Go ahead, Cindy. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abia, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. And they had no children because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias, to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready the people prepared for the Lord. And Zechariah said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee, and to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb, and not able to speak, until the day that these things shall be performed. Because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. And the people waited for Zacharias, and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak unto them, and they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple. 
for he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his administration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thus saith the Lord, have dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. Wow. So Luke, who is just a phenomenal writer anyway, starts this entire story off by giving us a time frame. He said it's in the days of Herod the Great. This is a rendition of, of Herod off of a coin. Kind of probably gives us a general idea. He reigned from 37 BCE to around 4 BCE, so about the time of Jesus' birth. He was officially appointed by the Roman Empire to be the, the regent king there. Uh, he was friends with both Mark Antony and Julius Caesar. So he had some very powerful friends. And the reason why he was set up is that the Parthians, if you go into history, they were on the march. Rome was still kind of the big dog, but they weren't the big dog. There was a few other guys out there that were still vying for who was going to be controlling the Mediterranean, and the Parthians had a pretty good army. They equipped, uh, the, the Romans equipped Herod with an army along with what he had there in Israel to repel the Parthians, defeated them soundly, and so now he was Rome's guy. And they appointed him as their, as the regent king of the area. So Luke starts by setting this thing all up in time. And then we're introduced to this first part of the story being Zechariah and Elizabeth. And what did we learn about them? Well, first off, he's a priest. Both of them are descendants of Aaron. So they're both within that priestly line as their heritage. They're both old and childless. But the most significant fact, I think, that Luke brings out is that they, are, they were both righteous and obeyed the Lord. They were both righteous. Luke makes sure to have his readers understand that not only were they of the Aaronic line, you know, brother of Moses, the priesthood, all of that, but they both were acting righteous. The biblical concept of righteousness is really rooted in both covenants and relationships. So when you talk about righteousness to the mind and the writers of the time, the roots in that had to do with, with covenants, with agreements between people and the relationship and how people acted on it. Because you were righteous if you had this relationship you had agreed to this covenant, I will do this, you will do that, and then you did it. Does that kind of coincide with your idea of, of somebody being a, a stand-up person? You ask them, to do, they agree to do something, and they do it. When you hire a contractor to come in and do something, what do you expect? That they will do exactly as they agreed to in the contract, and to do it well. So that's kind of where the, the biblical concept of righteousness is. For biblical authors, righteousness then is the fulfillment of the terms of a covenant between God and humanity. So when Luke writes and says they were both righteous, he's looking at it from the concept and the mental idea of the time that both of these people did what they were supposed to do to, with God. That they had that agree that working agreement with God. That God had said, I want you to do this, this, and this. I'm going to do this, this, and this. The covenants, of course, when you go to the Old Testament, you can see the great, the five great covenants, the Abrahamic and Mosaic and Davidic and all of these great covenants. But these two were doing it. And you kind of get the idea that it wasn't doing it like Fine. That's where the idea of this righteousness, the kind of the background concept is. Also, did people back then they kind of thought that like if you didn't have kids or something was going wrong in your life, that maybe you were a sinner, you were doing something. Yes. 
Yes. Clarify. That because they also had the scripture that children are a what from the Lord? So if you're not being blessed, that probably means you don't deserve it. Yeah. But Luke points out that these two were righteous before the Lord. So again, back to the story. Luke tells us that Zechariah was obediently serving in the temple. He's one of the, the groups. They, they, at that point, they had divided all of the priests into various groups so that you only had to serve a week or two at the time in the temple. You could go back and have your regular life and all the stuff you were supposed to be doing. So he's up there. He's in charge of doing the incense. The incense would be the, the offering of the prayers for the people. Didn't they only get to do that once in their lifetime? Yes. Again? Yeah, so he's got the special job. He's offering the prayers for the people. He's offering the incense for the people. And this is his special time. He's in the inner courtyard. He's, he's, he's not in the Holy of Holies. That's the last place. And that's the high priest once a year. But he's right next to it. And when you see a picture of, of the temple, you know where that altar was and where that burning, and that would, the smell would have filled the entire temple as they were doing that. So he's in taking care of, of his business. When the angel Gabriel appears to him, Gabriel tells him impossible news. Impossible news, air quotes. He's to have, a, not just he's have a child, you're going to have a son. And you're going to name him John. Now, as you all know, I, I tend to rabbit trail when I'm studying stuff. That's what I do. <laughs> and I thought, I don't know that I've ever looked up the name John. Ever. John's a very common name in our society. Um, fact is, you know, there have been many a hotel register that have been signed with the name John Smith. <laughs> and so I looked it up. The name John means pierced. Now, every time you read John and hear that, I want you to have that in the background of your head. This is something new for me. I've been studying the Bible literally my almost my entire life. And I've never, until this week, looked up the meaning of John, but all of a sudden, and particularly as we're looking at this particular John, but then we have another John that Jesus is dealing with, but John the Baptist, this son, his name, his name is pierced. I want you to kind of think about that a little bit, have that in the back of your mind as, as we go on. So, what story does this also immediately uh, Old Testament story bring to mind? Old, childless, you're going to have a son. Sarah and Sarah and Abraham. Yeah. yeah. Most people make that correlation immediately. Here's God again doing the, the impossible, air quotes. Who's in charge of life? God. God. Who's in charge of all life? God. There is no accidental life. One of the, again, the reasons that in my teaching on, on the Christian worldview up at Grand Canyon and dealing with these young minds, one of the things, one of the big problems out there, of course, and the Roe v. Wade decision that was struck down, I said, but from a Christian worldview, there's legal problems with it. When, I, when I'm teaching my law classes up at Glendale Community, I attack it from a legal perspective. Because, and, and this is one of the few times that Ruth Bader Ginsburg and I were in full agreement. We both agreed that from a legal standpoint, that was a mess. But then from a Christian worldview, it's a mess because God is the author of life. He decides when life happens. There is no accidental life. I'm always amazed when somebody, well, yeah, had an accident. No, no, you didn't. God is the author of life. So he's deciding... With, same with that Abraham and Sarah thing. I'm going to tell you what, what's going to happen. Then he gives instructions to him on how this young boy is to be raised. And they are very similar to a Nazarite vow. Now I have that for you at the bottom. You can look that up when you get home. It's in Numbers chapter 6, verses 1 through 12, which is the Nazarite vow. And you will see how similar 
that John, this son that Zechariah and Elizabeth are to have, is to be raised, it's almost part and partial with the Nazarite vow. This is before he's even conceived. Again, God being God, who he is, this takes us to another story. Who was another son who was pre-born, who was told and was to be raised with a Nazarite vow? Samson. 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 When, we, when we did the, remember we did the judges. He was a Nazarite from before he was born. He was, his parents were told, you will raise him in this way, and he was raised in that way right from the get-go. So we have that similarity there now with Samson. <coughs> so John's preconception purpose. Now, this is going to say, sound very Calvinistic of me, but work with me here. Um, because as you know, I'm a very strong Calvinist standing upon an Arminian base. As far as I'm concerned, both of those positions are right. How they work together, I don't know. I have to get to heaven, and God's going to have to explain it to me, because far greater theological minds than mine have never been able to completely marry those two positions. And if you don't know Calvinism and Arminianism, Calvinism is predestination. Everything is predestinated. Arminianism is total free will. God is just kind of standing around waiting to see what happens. Somehow both of those work because we have to make the choice, but God is in charge of everything. I said, I just know that they both work. But in this particular case, John's preconception purpose was that he would prepare the people for the coming of the Messiah. This is what God is telling him, telling his father, who hasn't even impregnated his mother yet, this is what this son that you're going to have, this is his purpose. This is what he's going to do. By calling them to repentance and proclaiming the coming of the anointed one. What's the anointed one? What is that? What's another? Come on, this, this is divig. What's that? Blessed. Blessed. Or what's a synonym for it? Starts with an M. Messiah. Remember David, the anointed one. Jesus, the anointed one. Messiah. He's going to proclaim the coming of the anointed one of the Messiah. This is the verbiage here takes us back into our study of David that we just paused because this is where it's going leading to. So he's to prepare the people. Here's more of this preparation. God is sending a preparation guy in front of his Messiah. This fulfilled a promise that God had made that a messenger would come. Here's that previous promise found in Malachi. I have a reader for Malachi. And that is Malachi, sorry Italians, it is not Malachi. <laughs> Go ahead, Malachi. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you see will suddenly come to his, to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. And then... And verse 6, and then 16 and 17. <coughs> um, 4, 5, and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Wow. So, God here is speaking through his prophet. And he says that this coming messenger is going to prepare the way of the Lord and that he's going to be a type of Elijah. He's going to be similar to Elijah and that he's going to be proclaiming this and people are going to turn. That's his job. And he's going to turn in the hearts of the fathers and children to each other. What did we just hear Gabriel tell Zechariah would happen. All of those same details are spelled out by Gabriel to Zechariah, exactly as Malachi had prophesied. 
And now Gabriel's telling him, here's what's going to happen. Don't think that this was lost on Zechariah when he's hearing this. He's a priest. His entire job is to study the law, to study the prophets, to study the wisdom literature. When he hears this, his mind would have been drawn back. Malachi is the last of the prophets. 400 years, it's, they have not heard from God. And the last thing that Malachi, the last prophet, tells that, and now Gabriel is telling him, you are having the guy that Malachi prophesied. But Malachi wasn't the only prophet to talk about this guy who was coming to prepare things. Isaiah also had something to say. We're going to see it first off in Luke chapter 3, verses 3 through 6. And he came to all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming the baptism of repentance, and the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall be, become straight, and the rough places shall become level ways, and all the flesh shall see the salvation of God. Wow. Um, go ahead and read verse 6. If you're still, or, oh no, no, excuse me, you're, you're there. Um, this is a direct quote taken from the prophet Isaiah in chapter 40, verses 3 through 5. Listen to it in Isaiah. A voice of one crying out, prepare the way of the Lord in the wilderness, make a straight highway for our God in the desert. Every valley will be lifted up, every mountain and hill will be leveled, the uneven ground will become smooth, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will appear, and all humanity will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice was crying, saying, Cry out. Another said, What should I cry out? All humanity is grass, and all goodness is like the flower of the field. Luke quotes the prophet Isaiah, saying that this person coming is going to be teaching and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So Luke has looked both back at Malachi and at Isaiah. And so what we see here is that John, the piercing one, is preparing the way for the Messiah. He is going to pierce the people. His name, John. Again, I've read this my entire life. I've read this story 400,000 times. That may be a little hyperbole on my part. But now understanding that John means pierce or piercing, he, like Elijah, is going to pierce the people's soul and say, you need to repent. I'm going to, we're going to start preparing your hearts by repenting before the anointed one, the Messiah, shows up and everything's going to be different. He's the sign of the coming of the Messiah. But he has that dual purpose of calling the people to repentance. So just his very life is one of preparing the people and that's going to be done by calling them to repentance. This person who is a piercing one pierced. God's promise to send a messenger to announce the coming Messiah. He promised to do that. And in preparation of Jesus, God sends Gabriel to Zechariah to tell him that he'd have a son in his old age who's to be set apart for this purpose. And when he is able to speak again, when he's finally able to talk, after the birth of of his son and when he writes that his name is John and there's all that in there they're saying John that's not a family name where are you getting that name him John and as soon as that is fulfilled he's able to speak again and he makes this great prophecy in Luke chapter 1 verses 68 to 79 listen to this prophecy this is the he hasn't been able to talk for nine months 
Imagine the things that you would say the first time you could now suddenly speak again. This is what he says. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and provided redemption for his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Just as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets in ancient times, salvation from our enemies and from the clutches of those who hate us, he has dealt mercifully with our fathers and remembered his holy covenant. The oath that he swore to our father Abraham, he has given us the privilege since we have been rescued from our enemies' clutches to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness in his presence all of our days. And child, I can see him holding his newborn son, looking at him and saying, and child, you will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give his people knowledge of salvation, through the forgiveness of their sins, because of our God's merciful compassion, the dawn from on high will visit us. Can you imagine looking at his son and saying this? This is what you are going to do. To shine on those who live in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. That is Zechariah's first speech after nine months of not being able to speak. He starts by praising God and then telling his son what he's going to be doing in remembrance of what Gabriel had told him. He's already preparing his son at birth for what he's going to do. But God didn't just prepare the, the, the announcer who was going to prepare the way. He began to prepare Mary and Joseph as well. Matthew gives us a, a genealogy. We're going to look at a couple of those here real quick this morning as, as we're looking at this preparation. And Matthew chapter 1, verse 2, I'm going to read, and I'm going to kind of skip around through the genealogy a little bit. I'm going to read Matthew chapter 1, and these are in your notes. Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, verse 6. And verse 16 and 17. The historical record of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham fathered Isaac, Isaac fathered Jacob, Jacob fathered Judah and his brothers. Verse 6. And Jesse fathered King David. Then David fathered Solomon by Uriah's wife. And then verses 16 and 17. And Jacob fathered Joseph, the husband of Mary who gave birth to Jesus, who is called the Messiah. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David until the exile to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the exile to Babylon until the Messiah, 14 generations. The important names that really come out in Matthew's genealogy are the big names in the Bible. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, David, Joseph, Mary. Now let's go over to Luke chapter 3, and we're going to skim through this genealogy in the same way. I'm going to read verses 23, 31 to 34, and 38. Starting in verse 23. As he began his ministry, Jesus was about 30 years old and was thought to be the son of Joseph, son of Heli. Verses 31 and 34. Son of Malia, son of Mena, son of Matha, son of Nathan, son of David, son of Jesse, son of Obed, son of Boaz, son of Salmon, son of Nation, son of Aminadab, son of Ram, son of Hezron, son of Perez, son of Judah, son of Jacob, son of Isaac, son of Abraham, son of Terah, son of Nahor, son of Serug, son of Ru, son of Peleg, son of Eber, son of Shelah. And then verse 38, son of Enos, son of Sheth, son of Adam, son of God. 
Again, we see the big names. Joseph, David, Judah, Jacob, Isaac, Abraham. But with Luke, Luke also takes us all the way back to Adam through Shem, the <coughs> son of Noah. Now, as critics of the Bible look at these and say, we have two different genealogies. Do we have a problem here? Because they don't look exactly alike. Is there a genealogy problem? Here's what we're looking at. Matthew is the genealogy of Joseph. And the list in Luke is the lineage of Mary. And yet, we find common names in there. As I've done the genealogy work between Cindy and I and our two families, I have found, if you go way back, that we have some similar ancestors. And what happened is one ancestor had several kids, and then they would have, you know, they and brought down. But then as you backtrace it, we have a similar great grandfather way back. A lot of greats. Well, I'm not talking great great, I'm talking a bunch of greats in there. So you're going to see some similarities in these two lists, but you have the two lists, one of Abraham, or one of, Je of, of Joseph and the other of Mary. In the Matthew passage, it ends by saying that Jacob fathered Joseph, but it doesn't claim that Joseph fathered Jesus. The, la the lineage ends and it goes top down and it says that Joseph, who was his father, but it never says that Joseph fathered Jesus. There's a clear distinction that Jesus was born of Mary and that Joseph was her husband. In the Luke passage, the genealogy is reversed. It starts at the bottom and goes all the way back, literally to Abraham and creation of Adam, of man, by God. It starts with Jesus, who's the supposed son of Joseph, but Luke makes it clear that Jesus was not fathered by him as well. In Luke's genealogy, the Greek language that he writes in doesn't include the word son. When you go back and look at it in the original Greek, it's not the son of. Rather, each is said to be of the next. Joseph of Heli, of Mathat, of Levi, and so on. So the word son isn't in there. In this case, case, Heli, again, if you go into your deep history, if you really want to start digging into this, Heli only had daughters. He had no sons. So it, when he says, of Heli, and according to Mosaic law, this meant that when Mary got married, her husband carried on the line of her father. This is important stuff. Because her father only had daughters, and so his son-in-law would now be, under the Mosaic Law, the person who carried on his line. He's carrying his dad's line, and now his father-in-law's line. So they're joined together, and this is a cultural thing. Both of them, though, were of the line of David. And God had promised Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, and eventually David that the Messiah would come from their offspring. And now he has prepared two people who have that lineage. It's a double tap on God honoring his promise. God prepared both Mary and Joseph as descendants of David to be the parents of Jesus from a bloodline way. But he prepared them on a much more personal level as well. 
So I wanted to draw that out on this preparation that God ordained all of these fathers and sons and daughters. Heli only had daughters to bring that down to where he had two people that were of the household of David to honor that Davidic covenant and the Abrahamic covenant and that he re redid with Isaac and that he redid with Jacob, saying, out of your line, one who will bless the entire world will come. And through the Mary line, we see that that takes it all the way back. So he begins to prepare them on a much more personal level as well. Let's look at Mary's prep. And this is one of the more difficult things. This Christmas season and, and in looking at this stuff again is trying to look at it in a, in a new way. Because if you've been raised in church like I have, you've gone over the Christmas story now for me 65 times <laughs> or more. So what am I learning? What am I looking at? Well, sometimes it's good to just go back and look at it again. Because in our busy lives, we begin to fluff off those details. So Mary's preparation. Uh, somebody want to read, uh, who do I have for Luke 1, 26 to 38? Go ahead. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin across to a man whose name was Joseph of the, son, of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, and the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb, and bring forth the Son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. <coughs> then Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I have not known a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month of her who was called barren. For with God nothing will be impossible. Love that closing verse. <laughs> then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Wow. Essentially what she says there is, yes, God. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so Gabriel is back. And just like with Zechariah, she's told, don't be afraid. She's also going to have a son. And what his name is and what his mission will be. So just like Gabriel tells Zechariah what John his name is going to be, what his mission is, he's doing the same thing with Mary about Jesus. There are some differences here. Before, with Zechariah, he speaks to the father. Now, with Jesus, he's speaking to the mother. Again, this begins to address all of those critics that say that Christianity is all male-centered. I can disprove that all day long. First person Jesus tells who he is, is to a woman, and not even a Jewish woman, to a Samaritan, and on and on. Here, now he sent, God sends Gabriel to speak to the mother first, not to Joseph. The first time I'm speaking to the father, now I'm speaking to the mother. He shows that the Imago Dei, the image of God, the equality of men and women, is built into God's creation. Now he's talking to the mother. Zachariah's question when remember he questions it, was how it was dealt with, you're not going to be able to speak because what was recognized in Zechariah? That's 
he doubted. You doubt it. You don't believe this. With Mary, apparently that's not there because she's met with reassurance and an explanation. Let me explain to you what's going on and why. So Gabriel, God lets Gabriel understand that Mary, unlike Zachariah, isn't going, yeah, I don't think so. She's going, wow, how does, how does this work? I haven't, I haven't been with a guy, you know. <laughs> I know this whole basic, you know, I know how this works, and it ain't here. So it's, for her part, it's not doubt, it, it's confusion. I, I don't know how this is supposed to work. And so you see the difference there, that how he deals with her. Gabriel prepared Mary. This is all about preparation today, folks. Gabriel prepares Mary for what was coming by explaining to her that she was favored by God and that her son would be the Messiah. Zacharias told John, your son is going to be the preparation for the Messiah. He also reassures her that God was in control and that he's all powerful and he does this with a nice word picture by saying, you know what, your, your, your cousin Elizabeth, your much older cousin who lives in a different town, you know, you didn't have Facebook, so you didn't get her profile that says, woo, <laughs> pregnant. <laughs> she's, she's pregnant. In fact, is, she's three months along. She's ahead of you. This is how powerful your God is. That the lady that you knew, your cousin, who was never going to have a kid, is now going to have a child. He also, God also, he prepares Mary, but he also goes in now and prepares Joseph. Matthew 1, 18 to 25. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but because they came, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will give him the name of Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. <clears throat> All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophets. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave, the, gave him the name Jesus. So all of this happens now, after what we just read about in Luke and the preparation of Mary. This is happening after. He's already, God through Gabriel has already prepared Mary and now he's going to go and prepare Joseph. Mary and Joseph were betrothed and again if, you, if you've been raised in church or if you've done any study on this, the marriage process back then was this long, drawn-out process. But from the moment it started, the moment the contract was signed, you were considered legally married. There still had, there was more steps and the big feast and all that, and then actually moving in together and going and getting your bride, all that sort of stuff. But they are betrothed, which means they are legally bound together. Mary is pregnant. Joseph knows this at this point. We don't know how. 
That had to be an interesting conversation, don't you think, ladies? <laughs> um, Joseph, can we talk? Privately? Got a little something to share with you. I swear it was the Holy Spirit. Yeah. <laughs> Joseph's initial plan, it first off says that this is a, a, a law-following guy. He follows the law. But he's going to do so, he doesn't want to shame Mary. Apparently he likes her. He said, I don't want to shame her. I'm going to just quietly divorce her. I'm going to quietly give her rent of divorce and let that go away. And we'll just go on our separate paths. Then he gets visited by an angel in a dream. Now there's a lot of speculation as to whether this is Gabriel or not. But Matthew doesn't tell us. So we don't know. I like to think it's Gabriel because God is sending messenger. You have the same messenger around. But we don't know. Just an angel visits him in a dream. And he's told to take Mary as his wife. And it's explained to him that she is pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit and that the coming child was to be the Savior. So with, you're kind of joking, but she may have said, no, I swear it's by the Holy Spirit. Now the angel says, would you listen to her? When, when she said it's by the Holy Spirit, that's where she's pregnant by. This is God's power. This No man is involved in this. He used to be called Jesus. Do you know that that's what the name Jesus means? God saves. He's the Savior. Why going on a deep dive, why did the why did they say to give him a Greek name? Because Jesus is the Greek version of Joshua. Yes. Which is, and if you go back and read it in a Hebrew written New Testament, it says that. This is for all of us English reader types. And for the common language of the name. Um, there is some speculation. Okay. Did you hear that word? <clears throat> speculation. That some of the early writers may have switched it, the, some of the letters up slightly to make sure that there was a definite differentiation. We don't know that. That is speculation. To separate, to make him speak even more special or gotcha. <laughs> um, but this is this is kind of tricks of language again English being a very word poor thing so that's in, in that deep dive that's where the, the, the idea that comes from but his name is Joshua Yeshua Joshua God saves so it's more really more of a transliteration than anything else so but he's told, you're going to be the Savior, this son that she's going to have. And what is Joseph's response? you got to love this. This is a great, Joseph is a great study, by the way. There's not much, we don't know much about him, but what we do know is great because his immediate response is obedience. Matthew says that he gets up and says, we're finishing the wedding today, let's go. My gal is pregnant. Pretty soon, the whole world's going to know what she is. I'm finishing this up. He protects Mary. He immediately obeys what the angel tells him and finishes off the wedding, and they are now man and wife. But it, then it says, very specifically, they did not consummate the marriage until after the birth of Jesus. This is a strong man. This is a man who respects, in a culture that did not necessarily respect women, who respected his wife. We saw that in his idea of not wanting to publicly shame her, and now I'm going to make sure that she's not shamed because she's going to be my wife. We are going to finish off the wedding ceremony, so anybody that sees that belly starting to go, Bruh? well, they're married. It's interesting, um, it's interesting but he did not know her until she had given birth. Mm -hmm. So that kind of implies that he did know her after they had given birth. Yes. Which 
other groups think that that never happened, ever. Well, yes, uh, our, our Catholic friends want her to remain a virgin forever. But that just, and you have to just really go through some crazy hoops to try and have him pre-marry and older brothers. The problem with that is then on the cross when he takes charge of Mary and says, John, this is your mother, mother, this is your son. That would not have happened because that would not have been his responsibility. So there's all kinds of, so, but trying to make her a virgin forever just doesn't work. But Joseph's response is immediate obedience. See, God had a plan from the beginning, and he was preparing things all along the way. Orchestrating events, orchestrating family lineages to result in the exact environment that we find Jesus born into. Matthew focuses on the Jewish perspective of Jesus being the eternal king, coming for the throne of David. While Luke emphasizes the humanity of Jesus. He takes him all the way back to Adam. One is looking at the Jewish king. One is looking at the humanity. He's fully human along with being fully God. By tracing the line of Jesus back to Adam, Luke is pointing to the origination of sin and death that, in the world and thus the need for a savior. He takes us back to Adam and the fall. Something that Matthew doesn't do because Matthew is focused on this kingship. And though both are right. He also prepared, though, for Jesus to come from the kingly line, the Jewish patriarch, and the first Adam, all who was the father of sinful man, of sinful man but he also prepared Jesus to be born of a virgin to take him out of the sin line that is passed through fathers. Look at the preparation here. I'm taking you back to Adam and the fall, but I'm going to, who is sin passed through? Sorry guys, it ain't your wife. It's passed through Adam and there's theological reasons for that. Remember, Eve was deceived. She was tricked. Adam, it says, when she took it and ate it, she gave it to Adam who was with her. He's watching her being tricked. He does nothing about it, and then he willfully takes it. The sin line passes through the fathers because Adam's sin was willful. Eve was tricked. And Adam allowed it to happen. He wanted to see if she would drop dead. This is the kind of husband y'all want, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Oh, you didn't drop. Okay, no, I'll try that. Make sure she didn't die. Yeah. Well, you didn't die. Okay, now I'll get in. So God prepares Jesus, even humanity, but to step out of that sin line because there is no father for the sin line to pass through. Let's, let's draw this to some application. We're, we're out of time. Or we're right on time. Because we're preparing for Christmas, folks. I know it's only the 27th of November. But Christmas is four weeks away. Five weeks away. Five weeks from today. On the calendar. But Christmas is a thing. When we stop to look at the intricate details of the birth of Jesus... We should see a whole lot more than just the Christmas story that we have been raised with our entire lives. Now, sure, it's important to revisit the account of Jesus' birth. But all too often, people want to go into this stylized, almost fairy tale of an infant worshipped by kings inside of a manger or inside of a stable with kings and a star overhead and it's this stylized fairy tale 
Most of the misconceptions about the Christmas story come from our own failure to be very intentional about our celebration of this holiday. As you and your family prepare for Christmas this year, my charge for this class is to do, do not settle for reading the same children's book you read every year, and instead take the opportunity to really dig into the significance behind Jesus' birth. Amen. Dig into his nature. Why was it only a, a, a virgin? Well, because of the sin line. Why were they both of the line of David? Because of the Davidic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant that was repeated to Isaac and Jacob. All of the pieces that led to his coming. Be intentional about looking and preparing for Christmas. And if you have little ones, or if you have grandchildren, or maybe great-grandchildren, how are we preparing them for this season as well. To be intentional about it. To not just gloss through another Christmas season. God was very careful in all of his preparations to get to this exact point in history. We should have seen that this morning as he prepared Zechariah and Elizabeth and John, and Joseph, and Mary. He prepared everything for generations to get to that point. Shouldn't we try to be that careful in our preparation and our studying for remembering and celebrating what he did? As you are preparing for Christmas this year and putting up lights and putting up trees and getting sit ales and wrapping presents, what also are you preparing to remember and do? Um, there's a book that I was introduced to a number of years ago, and it is fiction, uh, but it's called The Other Life Band terrific study about the guy who didn't get there on time and spent the rest of his life looking for that king and all that he witnesses and does as a result. And it's not very long. It's a little long. What's it called? The Other Wise the Man. Other wise man. I think it's Henry Van Dyke's book. I'm not sure. No, I'll have to check it out. The Other Wise Man. I, I have one copy at home, but it's, it's, a, it's really good. Sounds good. Let's prepare, shall we? Eric, would you close us this morning? Oh, yes. <clears throat> Father God, thank you so much for blessing us. <clears throat> I just ask that you prepare our hearts as we uh, go to hear the message today. I just ask that you, that you prepare us this morning uh, to hear your message and your truth, Lord. And we're so grateful. Amen. Yeah.